All right, we are going to continue with the time of scripture reading. Our text today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, verses 14 through 28. I will read the text aloud. You can follow along at your own Bibles or on the words on the screen. Now, he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke. And the people marveled. But some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan is also divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are safe, but when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and finding none. It says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. As he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you, and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, I uh, don't start every sermon like this, but uh, just FYI, I have some mature themes and material in the sermon today. We're going to be talking about spiritual warfare and not just the ways that spiritual warfare shows up in terms of spirits, but also in terms of strongholds and really painful topics and subjects that come up in the world. So just wanted to give you that as a thumbnail to be aware of for yourself. And in particular, if you have kids in the service who are right on the cusp of navigating some of these sorts of questions, just want to give you the opportunity to make the best decisions that you can for you and your family as we head into the sermon. All right. Um, I want to start today by asking this question. Uh, what do the works of spiritual darkness look like? What are the works of spiritual darkness? You know, in our text today that we just read, the whole episode is set off and begins uh, with uh, the, the story of someone who uh, has a demon. They're, they're, they're possessed by a demon. That's how the text begins. In Luke chapter 14, and the demon has uh, made someone mute. It's a demon of, of muteness, and Jesus drives them out. And we look at that today and read that and think, you know, really? You know, spirits and demons and we sort of think like exorcist crazy type movies in our minds and all that sort of stuff. And, and we can sort of read this thing and think, gosh, you know, uh, I'm just sort of going to discount the uh, spiritual narrative here, the spiritual powers that look like they're at play. Really a, 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 a demonic muteness. Gosh, that's just really kind of hard for us to wrestle with today and take on and listen to the biblical witness. Uh, in the mid-1930s, uh, there was an eight-year-old girl named Marguerite Annie Johnson, and she was sexually assaulted by a family member. And in the wake of this, she told some other people in her family that this had happened, uh, and they went and killed uh, the person who assaulted her. And as a result of that, uh, this girl became mute for five years. She didn't talk for five years. And later, when she reflected on it, she said, I thought my voice killed me. She said, I, I killed that man because I told his name. And then I thought I would never speak again because my voice would kill anyone. The dynamics that are present in this story, all of the pain that's here, the egregious wounding, and then the way that the person who was wounded received the, received the, the effects of her voice leading her into silence, is that any less demonic than the story that we read here in Luke chapter 14, verses 14 to 15? And if it isn't any less demonic, then can we account for these sorts of dynamics in our world without the category of real evil? 
real spiritual personified evil? The girl in the story, uh, she, she grew. She began to rediscover her voice. She changed her name over time to Maya Angelou. And she went on to have one of the most powerful poetic and prophetic voices in the civil rights movement. This is what she wrote at the end of probably her most famous poem, Caged Bird. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown but longed for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. What is the demonic? How do we account for the demonic in our life today when we encounter biblical texts about these things? How do we wrestle with them? How do we understand them in our life? Is it possible to have a Christ-centered practice of spiritual warfare that's not shaped by all the crazy exorcist movies? Uh, we're in the middle of a sermon series uh, titled Life in God's Vineyard, where we're really turning the page into a new season of vineyard identity and church theology and practice in the life of our church. And uh, we're, we're in this uh, initial movement in this long sermon series where we're looking at Jesus' foundational message about the kingdom of God. A couple weeks ago, we looked at his foundational proclamation that the kingdom of God is here. And now, uh, this week and last week, and uh, I think next week as well, we're looking at what Jesus taught about that proclamation. We saw a couple weeks ago that Jesus made proclamations that the kingdom of God is here. The rule of God is here. God is running things. But he didn't just proclaim that. He taught about it. He taught about what it meant for God's kingdom to be here and for God to be running things. We looked last week at Jesus teaching that God's kingdom is already here and not yet here at the same time. And this week we're looking at God, uh, Jesus teaching that God's kingdom comes in the context of a cosmic spiritual battle. That to talk about the kingdom of God is to implicitly talk about the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of Satan that actively opposes God's will and God's purposes in the world. This teaching is what we're going to be looking at today. I've titled today's sermon, Contending with the Devil. We pray. Heavenly Father, we just come before you, God. And Lord, I just want to acknowledge all the different sorts of things that might be coming up for us even five minutes in. Questions about spiritual realities, maybe different church experiences we've had. Maybe these things have been handled in ways that have been more or less helpful. Maybe we're wrestling with deep darkness and pain in our own lives. And just talking about it and naming it is really challenging. God, all these things, we need you to come now in the name of Jesus. We need you. We're going to open these things up, and we're going to talk about them, and, and we're going to ask these questions, and we're going to look these things in the face, God. We need your presence. We need you, God. So would you come? Come. Come, Holy Spirit. God, we thank you that you're with us. And Lord, we pray for your courage in this time. So look clearly at the world and look clearly at ourselves and look clearly at the reality of the spiritual battle that you are currently fighting and waging against the forces of darkness in the world. God, would you please pour your spirit out on me to minister and teach and preach your word and power. God, would you pour your spirit out on everybody gathered here today, that we might be able to have our minds renewed and our eyes open to the things that you are doing in the world. We ask for these things in the name of Jesus. Jesus taught that God's kingdom is opposed by kingdom of darkness. Jesus taught this, and it was part of his own belief and framework and understanding in the world. 
We see this in our text. It's, uh, it sort of assumes uh, Jesus is casting out a demon. So obviously he thinks that that can happen and thinks that it's real because he's doing it. In the text of the gospel, he's casting out a demon. And people accuse him of being uh, Beelzebul. Uh, and Jesus engages in this dialogue with them where he's like, okay, you know, if I'm casting out demons by a stronger demon, you know, does that really make sense? A house divided cannot stand. Who's this Beelzebul guy? Jesus identifies this Beelzebul character with uh, Satan. Uh, the name Beelzebul comes from uh, an Old Testament context. We see it show up in 2 Kings chapter 1, verses 2 to 3. The text reads this. Now Ahaziah, who is an Israelite king, fell through the lattice in his upper chamber in Samaria and lay sick. So he sent messengers telling them, Go inquire of Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron whether I shall recover from the sickness. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say to them, Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going to inquire of Baal's above, the god of Ekra? So this Baal's above guy, uh, in the context of 2 Kings chapter 1, he's a god in Ekra, which is a Philistine city. But if you uh, are even, uh, if you're you know familiar with the scriptures more generally, when you hear the name Baal's above, you probably recognize that first name, Baal. Uh, which can mean Lord, and uh, Baal was a god of a nation surrounding Israel in the Old Testament, and he was sort of seen as a chief and primary enemy and adversary of God in the Old Testament. The name uh, Baal Zebub or Beelzebul has a number of interpretive options that are kind of difficult to navigate, and scholars disagree about them. Some people think it means uh, Lord of the Flies or like Lord of the Dung Heap. The word Baal certainly means Lord, and then how to handle the, uh, the Zebub or Zul at the end. It just uh, has a lot of different, uh, different opinions. So some people think it's like an image of death or filth. So like Lord of the Flies, Lord of the Donkey. Some people think it's an image of grandiosity or power. So they think uh, uh, Beelzebul means something like Lord of the House or Lord of the Heavens. That there's like a sort of like Baal in the Old Testament was seen as this storm god who is, you know, mighty and competing for Yahweh's power, Yahweh being the God of Israel. Uh, that that Beelzebul means Lord of the House or Lord of the Heavens. And actually, there's an there's a ancient Greek connection between uh, this idea of this god being like a, a lord of the heavens and the Greek god Zeus. Uh, every ancient culture is some sort of storm god or lightning god, right? And, and it's easy to imagine how, you know, if you believe in a god like sits in the cloud and like throws lightning bolts down, that's going to compete with your idea of like a god in the heavens, right? The, the, the biblical god uh, revealed in the Old Testament. Either way, no matter what sort of this word is getting at, there's some sort of uh, uh, contention here between this character and the God of the Bible. And Jesus explicitly links this name, Beelzebul, to Satan. Uh, that's why in the text, uh, you know, they, they accuse Jesus of casting out demons by Beelzebul. They sort of say, you're using the power of a greater spirit to cast out a lesser spirit. And Jesus, when talking about it, says, if Satan is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Right? For you said that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. So Jesus is using the language of Beelzebul and Satan interchangeably. He's identifying both images and names and titles as this one particular adversary against God and God's purposes. So Jesus believed that there are cosmic spiritual forces of darkness that are literally hell-bent on opposing the plans and purposes of God. Now we think about this today and we're like, really? Satan, you know, demons, spirits, you know, I, that is for a, a different time or a different context, you know. It can just be difficult for us to engage with that in a serious and significant way. In modern thought, Satan, right, is sort of this, like, comical character in red tights with, like, a pointy tail and horns and maybe shows up in comedic settings on shoulders, right, against angels. And it's just hard to take any of that seriously. That's something that we think is meaningful for our old lives and helps us to understand and interpret and make sense of the modern world. Now, it's interesting, of course, because that the image of sort of Satan uh, as that sort of red tights uh, guy um, maybe comes from, from like excesses of like medieval thought and imagery around sort of demons and sprites and that sort of thing. But it's actually interesting because there are many places actually in medieval thought where Satan gets a much more nuanced treatment than that idea that we have in our heads. So for example, in Dante's Inferno, which is often a place that we go to, we think of, oh my gosh, these horrifying images of hell and all that sort of stuff, Satan is not like 
in the fire of hell in Dante's Inferno. He's actually in this icy uh, center ring of hell. And he's in the ice because it's a kingdom of grief. It's, he's like the king over this frozen, grief-stricken kingdom of death. This is the image of um, the pilgrim seeing Satan at the climax of Dante's Inferno. The king of the vast kingdom of all grief stuck out with, his, with half his chest above the ice. If once he was as fair as now he's foul and dared to raise his brows against his maker, it is fit that all grief should spring from him. It goes on to give a sort of gruesome image. Uh, he's got multiple faces. Uh, it says he wept. He's weeping from all of his eyes. And at the same time, down three trin chins are dripping tears mixed with a bloody slapper. It's this image of grief and frozenness and death all wrapped up in one. Now, as we're thinking about this in our own lives, and in particular trying to make sense of the demonic and spiritual forces in our own world today, there are maybe two helpful questions for us to ask. The first question is, what did Jesus believe? That's really the first question to ask, right? What did Jesus believe? Because it's really easy to start from the sort of modern incredulity. But if we ask the question, what did Jesus believe? That puts us back into a relationship of asking a more foundational question, which is, are we disciples of Jesus, or is Jesus a disciple of us? Right? Do we have things to learn from Jesus about the world, and what's going on in the world, and how we need to pray, and how we need to think about the world? Or when we meet Jesus face to face, are we going to say, we liked a lot of what you had to say, but there are some things that you didn't know? <laughs> right? That's the question that we're asking. So, what did Jesus believe? Jesus believed that dark spiritual forces are actively opposed to the will of God, this character named Satan, chief among them. Jesus believed that. Jesus teaches about Satan in John chapter 8, verse 44. He says, he, the devil, explicitly talking about Satan, was a murderer from the beginning. And he has nothing to do with the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he's a liar and the father of lies. So Jesus teaches about Satan. He says he's a murderer and he's a liar. He tells us about his character. Jesus associates the success of his own ministry with the demise of Satan. Earlier in the Gospel of Luke, in Luke chapter 10, verses 17 to 18, Jesus sends out 72 disciples to proclaim the kingdom of God, heal the sick, and cast out demons. And when they return, this is the exchange they have with Jesus. The 72 return with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Right? Jesus sees their ministry and says, the kingdom of Satan is being assaulted. Right? That's Jesus' own understanding of what's happening in the world, what's happening in his own ministry, and what's happening in the ministry of his followers. So question one, what did Jesus believe? Jesus believed that a central aspect of the teaching about God's coming rule and reign is that there's a kingdom of darkness that is actively being fought against. It's a real spiritual reality. Second question, do we need a category for evil to explain our modern world? Second question that can be helpful for us as we think about this, do we really need the category of personified, uh, supersized, more than the sum of its parts evil? to help us understand what's going on in the modern world. It was arguably the hope of modernity that the answer to that question would be no. We don't need a category of evil anymore to explain what's going on in the world. Everything can be explained in the modern world through some sort of human or societal ill, and the ways in which physical and material forces in, in personal relationships or in societal relationships over time create problems. But the hope of modernity was that we would be able, through more money and more education and better housing, to solve all of those societal ills. And so we don't need any more a category of evil to help us to understand our modern world. It's all explainable through physical, material, and historical forces. I, I want to suggest to you today, however, that we need the category of evil more than ever to help us understand why, especially in light of all our resources, 
all our communication and all our learning, the world seems to be spinning more out of control and isn't coming into any greater order uh, like we would expect to see. We need the category of evil today to explain how it is that the modern world can have everything that it has and still be going so egregiously wrong. There was a song that won a bunch of awards a couple years ago by the band The 1975 uh, called I'd Love It If We Made It. Uh, and I just want to share some of the lyrics from this song. They're really intense lyrics, uh, and there's some images in here that are really difficult to sit with. I've put out the most explicit images and language, and language. You should know that if you search for this song, you'll see some harder language than what you find here. Okay, so, uh, and, and actually the author of the song, Matty Healy, uh, has a video where he walks through in each of the lines and lyrics. So we're just going to look at sort of the cry of the anger and desperation that's in this song about the modern world. This is what this song says. Selling melanin and then suffocate the black man. Start with misdemeanors and we'll make a business out of them. And we can find out the information across all the applications that are hardening positions based on miscommunication. Truth is only hearsay. We're just left to decay. Modernity has failed us. Goes on to say, I've got the Jones right through my bones, right in on a piece of stone, a beach of drowning three-year-olds. Jesus save us. Modernity has failed us. And this cry of rage and anger and despair that's in this song is just full of all sorts of brutal and despicable events that we've seen happening over the last couple of years. Of course, the song starts by tracing the evil of slavery, then to police brutality against people of color. The language of suffocation comes from the tragedy of the suffocation of Eric Garner from 2014, who was in police custody in Staten Island when he was killed. It talks about the injustice of a for-profit prison system. Start with misdemeanors and we'll make a business out of it. It talks about the way in which all our access to information just makes people more and more angry at one another. We're actually, not information is an increasing relationship. It's increasing division and polarization. It's made us that truth is only hearsay. We're left to decay. I've got the Jones right through my bones, getting at images of not only drug use and addiction, but an attention economy that we just can't put down, that we're enslaved by. One of the most brutal images here is Beach of Drowning Three-Year-Olds. I don't remember, I uh, don't know if you remember the really gut-wrenching photo of Alan Purdy, who was a toddler who uh, drowned in the Syrian refugee crisis in 2015. All of this thing leads to what cry? Jesus, save us. Modernity has failed us. We see this all the time. We've seen it in the last week or two in our city with violence against Asian Americans, the shocking murders of Christina Lee and Michelle Go, do physical and material forces explain all of the scope of how awful this is? Do we actually have, if we omit the category of evil, that there is an enemy of our souls and the souls of this world and the soul of this creation, if we omit that category, does it really account for all of this? Can we account for this disgusting mess in the modern world today without saying there is evil, it's real, and it needs to be opposed spiritually on its own terms? And if you agree with that, if you find yourself looking at this mess and coming to that conclusion, then you are knocking on the door of the conclusion that the Apostle Paul reached in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The biblical picture is that not just in spirits that we again think about in these like, you know, hysterical demonic possession movies, but in the cosmic forces of what's going on in the world and in reality, there is a dark spiritual kingdom that wages war against us and wages war against God, and he needs to be opposed. 
That is the biblical picture. The Bible doesn't just teach, however, that God's rule is opposed by a dark rule. The Bible teaches that God is actively fighting a spiritual battle against these powers. For example, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 says, The reason the Son of God, of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Of all the things that we could say about why the Son of God appeared, this text says the reason why the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Colossians 1.13 He, God, the Father, delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. Here, the scripture talking about what happens in salvation. What has God won for us in Jesus? He's won for us a transference from an authority of darkness into a kingdom and a rule of light in the kingdom of his beloved son. Jesus teaches about this in our text today through what's known as the parable of the strong man. This is in Luke chapter 11, verses 20 to 22. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, and the kingdom of God has come upon you, when a strong man fully armed, God guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. When we hear biblical uh, language about strength and strong people, we often think that they're talking about God. But here the strong man is Satan. Jesus is saying that when there's a strong man who is guarding his palace and possessions, then the possessions are safe. But when someone stronger comes along, that stronger person disarms the strong man and plunders his house. Jesus says, this is what I am doing in the spiritual battles that I'm engaging in. I am binding up the strong man, Satan, who has real power and real strength. He says, I am the stronger one. I remove his armor, I bind him, and I plunder the things that he has stolen. That's what Jesus says he's doing in his ministry of spiritual warfare. Now, the text gives us two windows into the ways in which Jesus does this. The first window comes through the language of the finger of God. By the finger of God. If I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of heaven has come upon you. The language of the finger of God is taken from Exodus chapter 8, verses 18 to 19. This is what the text says. Uh, it's in the context of the power of God coming upon the Egyptians to deliver God's people out of slavery. And the text says, the magicians, the Egyptian magicians, tried by their secret arts to produce nuts, but they could not, to replicate one of the plagues. So there were nuts on man and beast. Then the magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. This is the finger of God. This is divine power showing up right now to drive out darkness and to silence the enemies of God. Jesus does this and he calls his followers to do this. To pray into the power of the finger of God showing up right now to drive out spiritual forces that oppress people. We do this in the vineyard. In vineyard churches, we pray that the power of God would come and break the powers of the kingdom of darkness in people's lives. We do this in a particular way. First of all, we do this paying attention to... Uh, Stephen, I think I've got a slide that's got like some lists of stuff. Yeah, there we go. We do this in a way, first of all, that holds the spiritual realm and the natural world, world together. So we're not looking around for, you know, dark spirits around every couch or chair when something's going wrong in our lives. We're like, oh my gosh, it must be a demon. You know, like, there are all sorts of reasons why something might be happening in our lives. Some of them, of course, could be things that are medical and need professional medical attention. And we don't do this thing where we're like, oh my gosh, that's, that's demonic. We're going to, you know, and then, you know, I'll pray for that. And don't go to the doctor. We're not doing it. But we are taking seriously the reality of spiritual evil in the world. And so there are times when we might say, yes, take care of that physical cause, and yes, do emotional health here, and yes, this, and yes, this, and 
Let's rebuke the work of the enemy. We do this in a way that's low hype, non superstitious, straightforward, less is more. We say things like, Satan, shut up. <laughs> Stop the voice of the accuser, be silence over this person. You know, we're, I can't say enough how much we're not doing the extra sense. <laughs> oh gosh, it's just the idea that's in our mind. And so when we think about praying for dark, you know, against the powers of darkness, we're often so turned off by it because the only model we have in our mind is are these just crazed, you know, images that are made to make lots of money. I, when Jesus prayed for people who were under the powers of spiritual darkness, first of all, it was never in doubt that they were under the power of spiritual darkness, right? There wasn't ever any guessing game. It wasn't like, well, we don't know. Are you just sick, or is this a demon? It was like, it's ob it's just obvious, right? So, you know, it, it's a similar thing for us. And then secondly, Jesus, he was just super simple about the way that he prayed about it. He said, you know, that dark voice, stop talking in the name of Jesus. Get out in the name of Jesus. We do something similar. Low height, straightforward non-superstitious, modeled after Jesus, simple prayers. We also make a clear distinction between the difference between something that you might call possession versus oppression, which again, <laughs> God, all the extra images. You know, mostly what we see are what we would call oppression, ways in which powers of darkness assail us in our lives. And oftentimes, that's what we see. We're not, when we pray against darkness in the lives of people, thinking that it's always some of the most just, you know, profound and dramatic and painful encounters of really the powers of darkness having a hold on something, something we might call, you know, possession. We're talking about mostly praying against oppression, although there are stories of people who today would say that they've encountered something that's more than that. Ultimately, in all these things, we take this stuff seriously and we're willing to pray about it. And I just want to share, even really quickly, a story from my own life over this past year. Um, I, gosh, about a year ago, started to have this recurring series of dreams that, you know, you sometimes have, you know, bad dreams or upsetting dreams. And then, at least for me, I discovered there's another category of dreams that are awful. I can't describe them any other way. They're awful, they're oppressive, they're more than bad dreams, they're disgusting. I, I don't know why I'm having these dreams. And I began about once a month to have this very oppressive nature of dream that I never had before. And last summer we did a, a thing in a church called Meet God Meet People and we learned different aspects about the life of the Spirit. And Phil Chorley, the pastor of the North Jersey Vineyard, came over and did something for us on praying against the powers of darkness. And during that time, he asked, hey, does anyone feel like they have some, some thing that they're going through in their life or level of darkness that they kind of can't explain or it seems to be more than some of the parts? And all of a sudden I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm having these dreams. Uh, and I just shared briefly with Phil and he prayed for me. I don't really remember what he prayed. I think he maybe said something about rebuking. It was super short and super simple. I haven't had one of those dreams since. I mean, that, that, that's, you know, that's not the only way that this could look. But that's one way that it might look in a vineyard practice of prayer against the spiritual forces of darkness. And I would tell you, it's made a tangible difference in my life, not having to go through that, right? That, like, sleep is precious enough without having the enemy bombard me once a month with these demonic images, right? And Phil prayed for that in a simple, clear way in the name of Jesus, and that's been gone from my life over the last year. So... One way that Jesus does this is uh, the power of God, the figure of God coming and casting out the powers of darkness. The second way, however, that we see that Jesus does this comes from the image not of the figure of God, but of the image of the strong man and the, uh, the strong man's plunder. There's a resonance here with uh, Isaiah chapter 49, 24 to 25, and 53 verse 12. This is what these texts say. Can the prey be taken for the mighty, or the captives of, a, of, captives of a tyrant be rescued? For thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken, and the prey of the tyrant uh, be rescued. For I will contend with those who contend with you, and I will save your children. Therefore, later in Isaiah 53, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death, 
and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So these two images put together are present in Luke chapter 14. The first is the picture of God saying, I will contend against those who are contending for you. I will fight on your behalf. And how will he do it? He says, I have a strong man myself, God says. I have a strong man. And I will give him, I, I will put him among the strong and give him a portion of the plunder of the strong because what? Because he poured his soul out to death. The strength of Jesus to ultimately break the back of the powers of darkness is done at the cross. Jesus wages war against the kingdom of darkness both in signs of power and ultimately when he disarms the powers and authorities through the power of of the sacrifice of the cross. Colossians 2.15 says, He, Jesus, disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Jesus has triumphed already over the kingdom of darkness and its powers and authorities at the cross. And so the kingdom of God, uh, one analogy that often gets used is the analogy of uh, uh, D-Day in World War II. Um, the kingdom of God uh, Jesus at the cross has already won the final victory against the powers of darkness. The, the, the outcome of the battle is not in doubt. And at the same time, there's this in-between time where Satan's works are being driven out and God calls his followers to contribute to the work of driving them out. In the same way that in World War II, uh, when the Allied forces landed on the beachhead of Normandy, the, the outcome of World War II was secure. Once the Allied forces got a, got a hold of the beachhead of Normandy, it was just a matter of time before they were able to uh, defeat the Axis forces. But there was still a year and a half, two years of really bloody war, right? A similar thing is happening in terms of the battle of the kingdom of light against the kingdom of darkness. But God is fighting on our behalf, and God will win. God does win. His victory is secure. This is what Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 to 10 says. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur. Satan prowls around like a roaring lion. First Peter says, in part because he already knows that at the cross his fate is sealed. This reality is not in doubt. And when we pray against and work against powers of darkness in our own lives and in our world, we do it against the backdrop of knowing that at the cross of Jesus Christ, the ultimate victory has already been won. So, to begin to bring this to a conclusion, uh, let's think real briefly about our role in the struggle uh, against the powers of darkness. First of all, Jesus calls us to join him in the plundering of the strong man's house. That's why Jesus says in verse 23, after giving the parable of the strong man, he says, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. It's interesting for Jesus to use strongly binary language like that, right? But in this context, he uses it. He's like, when it comes to the matter of fighting against the powers of darkness and plundering the house of the strong man, if you're not with us, then you're, the, what you're doing is harmful. Right? So Jesus calls us to say, how can we join in prayer against the powers of darkness in our world? And this can happen in many ways, in, in actual prayer, right, for the finger of God to come and drive out darkness in someone's life. It can be the pursuit of health in the world, of justice, health in relationships, or just getting better in our own mental health or emotional spaces. All of these things can be things that help to plunder the house of the strong man. So the first thing, join Jesus in plundering the strong man's house. The second thing is to fill your house with God's word so that darkness can't get in. Fill your house with God's word so that darkness can't get in. This little parable here of the spirit that went out of the house, right, and then went and found a bunch of other spirits and came back in, it sounds kind of confusing at first, You're like, what is going on? I, I think what's happening here is the conceptual framework of the parable of the strong man is still present in the second parable. Right, so Jesus is sort of saying, 
you know, there's this house, the strong man, Satan is there. I'm walking in, I'm throwing him out, and I'm beginning to plunder his house. And now I've given you this nice empty house. And Jesus is like, if you don't fill it with something, if you don't fill that house with something, the forces of darkness are going to be free to come right back. Right? That's why when Jesus, uh, this woman, stands out and says something that's absolutely true, she's like, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast of which you nursed. And Jesus says, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. The word that's used there for keep is the same word that's used to, to, to render guard, to describe what the strong man is doing over his own house. Right? So Jesus said, if you don't, once the house is cleared out, if you don't put the word of God in there and then guard the word of God in your own house, you've just got this empty soul. And when you've got this empty soul, this empty internal life, that's when the, the, the forces of darkness and the oppression of the enemy is able to come in. So we have to fill our house with God's words that darkness can't get. And finally, we have to take seriously the task of defending ourselves against the evil one. Paul goes on, once he writes about the principalities and powers in Ephesians 6, to write about putting on the whole armor of God, right? In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 to 18, it says, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can... Uh, extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. Without walking through every detail in this passage, notice the things that Paul says in there are armor. Notice the things that Paul says are armor. He says the truth is armor. When we tell the truth, when we pursue biblical truth, when we tell the truth about our lives, our relationships, that's defense against the work of the enemy being able to get into our life. The shield of faith, when we believe something, when we choose faith when things look hopeless, that's a defense against the work of the enemy. We have to take seriously the task of defending ourselves against the evil one. So, in these things, in plundering the strong man's house, joining with Jesus in prayer to drive out the works of the enemy, but then also for ourselves, in filling ourselves with God's word and taking seriously defending ourselves against the work of the enemy, we join with Jesus as we contend against the devil wherever his works might be found. Dark spiritual forces are alive and well in our world today, and we need to join Jesus in his strength, in his power, not ours, in praying against them in specific and cosmic, systemic contexts. And we need to take seriously defending ourselves from them with God's word and the tools of faith that God gives us so that we can continue to be light in a dark world and not ourselves be overwhelmed.